Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Amen. So good morning and welcome to East Livingston Baptist Church. If you're joining us online, welcome. We're um, happy that you've joined us today, especially if you're visiting with us today. Uh, this is our second Sunday of Advent as we look forward to the day that the Lord was sent the Lord was sent to us to die in our place and defeat death for us. On um, the second Sunday of Advent, as we think about his coming, we light the candle of peace, our second candle. Jesus Christ is our peace, as the Bible tells us. He is a prince of peace, and the fruit of his presence is peace, as we see in Isaiah and Galatians. Christ comes to bring justice, wholeness, and harmony to every relationship throughout all creation. Amen. So please uh, join us in the opening hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Please sing it. Thank you. 
here today. We thank you for the comfort that your presence brings in such a hostile world. O oh, great God of love and understanding, we thank you for your person, our personal relationships with you. You are truly a friend, Lord, who loves at all times. As we light the candle of peace, Lord, help us to remember that part of our spiritual armor, feet shod with the preparation of peace. Bless and protect us today. We rebuke all works of the enemy in Jesus' name. And may, Lord, your will be done in the service today. As we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And, of course, fellowship, if you like. Sorry about that. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Do you have any visitors today? Um, don't get ever get better at remembering everybody. So <laughs> doesn't look like we have anybody visiting. Uh, if you're visiting with us online again, it's so nice to have you with us. So a few announcements. Uh, we've got... Uh, of course, uh, Communion Sunday, uh, if you're, of course, at home, uh, this might be a good time to, you know, find something at home to, you know, um, use in lieu of the uh, the crackers and the juice, you know, so if you have something at home, like a piece of bread and some uh, juice or something. 
Also, uh, we've got some more uh, news from uh, from Pat uh, about the search committee. Uh, if you, uh, so um, she's asking uh, um, us, us to stay after service today for, uh, for that. Uh, we've got uh, from uh, well, from today until January third, we are accepting the offering for retired ministers and missionaries uh, to bless them and. The work that they've done, uh, you know, as they worked for the kingdom and for the American Baptist Church. We do have a Christmas Eve service on December 24th and then another one on uh, Christmas Day. And of course, please remember uh, those in the prayer list uh, this week. Do, do we have any updates uh, on anyone in the uh, prayer list? Oh, sorry. And uh, I didn't catch the first one. I'm sorry. They came to Texas on his wife and Michelle. Okay. So her mother's last year, New Year's, and now. Thank you. Sorry to hear Yeah, thank you. Uh, this morning. Okay. And so um, the next uh, next we have um, the lighting of the uh, lighting of the candles for the Advent wreath. today is called the Bethlehem candle. It is a symbol of the preparations being made to receive and cradle the Christ child. But you, Bethlehem, the least of the clans of Judah, from you will come for me the future ruler of Israel, whose origins have been of old from everlasting. Stir up our hearts, O God, to prepare the way for your only Son. By his coming, give us strength in our conflicts and shed light on our paths through the darkness of this world. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. starts with I <laughs> in the program here. Yeah, okay. Oh, please stay. Yeah, thank you.
situation with Lazarus as you cried tears for him. So Lord, we pray that Master, you'd strengthen the family, Lord, and be with them in this very trying time, Lord, and help them to know, Lord, that you care if no one else does. Lord, we thank you for the actions of the search committee. 
Pastor, and how they've, they've served this ministry and how they've uh, tirelessly worked to bring about your will. And we pray, Master, for all of our hearts as well, that uh, when uh, he comes to visit and he comes to preach and that we would, that your will would be with us and we'd know what your will is as far as the next leader of this fellowship. Pray, Master, as well, that you prepare his heart for serving uh, serving you in this ministry and that uh, he would be submitted to you as the head of the church, Lord Jesus. The rest of the sick, Master, who are mentioned in the bulletin, Lord, we pray that you remember them, Lord, and we know that you came to die for people just like this who are suffering and hurting. We pray, Lord, that you would keep us all safe, Master, from this virus that's raging through the world. We pray for the companies that are working on vaccines. We pray that uh, you would uh, help everything to go okay with that and that everything will be done responsibly. We thank you, Lord, for the uh, interim pastor and his family, and we thank you for how he has uh, tirelessly worked for us. We pray for Master the staff at this church as well, and we thank you so much for them, Lord, and we Pray, Master, that you bless them for what they've done for this church over the years. Help us all to remember, Lord, that you are our rock, you are our fortress, you are our deliverer. Regardless of whatever animosity we face in the world, we know the awesome power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. We know that. You know the mighty power that stands with us as we work to be ambassadors in this world and as we work, Lord, in your vineyard. So help us, Lord, to keep our eyes on you. Help us, Lord, to work to learn how to be a better example to others of how to follow Christ every day. That we would never bow the knee to any of the the evils in this world, but we would focus on how you have designed humans to interact with each other. How we're supposed to put the other person ahead of ourselves, or regard them as more important as ours than ourselves. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of bringing offering to you today. We thank you so much for, for that privilege, and we we bring it, Master, with a, a thankful heart, Father. And uh, we, we know that if we all bring our offering in the right way, that it will be accepted. So we thank you for accepting that, our offerings today. Master be with the pastors um, as he brings the message today and strengthen him and use him for your purpose and your will and your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Peter faithfully lived everything that he had been taught to value, especially the Word of God. And remarkably, that wasn't good enough. Think about that with me. Even though he was very faithful in what he did on the basis of what he had been taught, 
He was pushed by God through a spectrum. In this particular slide from one color to another. Pushed from one hard time to another. From one change to another. We're able to trace Peter several ways, but one is through the book of Luke. At the beginning of meeting Jesus, he said, yes, you can use my boat for preaching. And then Jesus said, put your net on the other side, go out. Oh, Master, we've already been working all through the night. Just do. And then when he saw the fish, get away from me. I'm a sinful man. And that's the very first of a lot of different corrections in the life of the Apostle Peter. What is amazing is that he was willing to be corrected by this man who wasn't a fisherman, but who obviously knew how to get fish. Peter left everything along with the people who worked alongside of him, and he followed the instructions. I'm telling you right. He followed the instructions that were given to him by a man who just moments before had terrified him and had him on his knees begging to go away. In chapter 6, verse 12, Peter becomes one of the closest disciples of Jesus, one of the twelve. A little bit later in that chapter, he comes across a time when Jesus is going through a crowd trying to get to what will be a resurrection of a little girl. And Jesus says, someone touched me. And Peter says, everybody is touching you. It's a crowd. We're hurrying as fast. Of course they touched you. And Jesus again corrects Peter sensitively. And Peter learns just how sensitive Jesus is. In chapter 9, he is given power, Peter is, to excise demons and to heal people. That's pretty good. And it worked. They actually did that. But he misses the very next story which just is a pattern. Sometimes he's good, sometimes he's not. He misses understanding what Jesus is doing in terms of feeding the 5,000. And so he has to feel the correction when Jesus says to him, I, you all know I started with just five loaves of bread and two fish. Now I want you to take all of it to these 5,000 people. Yes, sir. That's a correction, even though it's not in words. In chapter 9 again of Luke, Peter says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Wow. And then he proceeds to try to tell the one he has just called Messiah, God's best. Tells him how to be Messiah. Messiah. That's one of those times when you really didn't want to be Peter. Because I can almost see fire coming out of Jesus' eyes as well as love. Hey, Peter, don't you ever say that to me again. Okay, I put those words in, but you know that it must have been something that Jesus felt very strongly. They went from there, and a little bit of time, they had the transfiguration up on that mountain. And you remember, Moses and Elijah came. Peter stands there and goes, oh, uh, uh, I, I know what I'll do. I'm willing to build a hut, a temporary place for the three of you to stay, one for each of you. I'll honor you that way. It is such a wrong thing to do that for the only time in the Gospel of Luke, God the Father speaks from heaven and says, do you don't get it, do you? Okay. 
But you know, after all that list that I have given to you, I find it remarkable, because I know how people are, I'm one. I find it remarkable that Peter never gets mad enough at Jesus to simply walk away. You and I might very well. Somebody corrects us that severely, that often. I mean, if, that, if I'm not satisfactory the way I am, goodbye. Peter doesn't do that. Could, could you or I do what Peter did? Or are we visiting with someone that we need to respect? In chapter 22, Peter is ready to die with Jesus. He's just learned that one of the disciples will betray his master. Oh, I'm ready to die with you if that sort of thing were to come up. And in fact, he stands up against this crowd of hundreds, apparently. Pulls out his sword. He is ready to do exactly what he said. And then he stands corrected, humiliated, you might say, in front of however big that crowd was, including some of his closest, dearest friends. And the man at this point is totally confused. You would be. And he stays with Jesus. He denies. He has reason to walk away after failing that badly. And he stays with Jesus. In chapter 24 of Luke, he walks into the tomb of Jesus. There's nobody there. No body, nothing. A few pieces of linen, that's it. And he wonders what happened. This is the man that Jesus has repeatedly told, I am going to be killed, and on the third day I will rise from the dead. And when it happens, Peter doesn't recognize it plain as Jesus was. Peter realizes the issues that the Lord brings into his life. He's always, however, a step behind what God is doing. And even though that's the case, even though he looks clumsy along the way and knows it, he changes specifically, repeatedly, to pursue Jesus like the man. There are many positive changes in Peter that are also reinforced. In the early part of the book of Acts, the man who has done this denying, I wouldn't stand up to this crowd, I can't. That man becomes a Pentecostal preacher and a pummeled prisoner. And in both roles, he just talks Jesus all the time, the very one he had denied. Then you get into Acts chapter 8, and you find him, this guy who was friends with John and James, who had said, I think you ought to call down fire on these Samaritans. <laughs> he goes and shares the Holy Spirit with them. The man is changing. He obeys. And the next time we meet Peter, it is at the home of a tanner. Now, I've mentioned this to you before, but remember, Hebrew scriptures indicate you do not touch what has died. A tanner has to, in order to get the skin off of the carcass of the animal. And for that reason, a tanner was somewhat outside of the preferred people of Israel. Peter is starting to dare to venture outside of those limits. So before the story actually begins, you already know that he's not the same Peter that he used to be, who always made sure that he crossed every T and dotted every I, spiritually speaking. And then while he's staying at the home of that man, he has this dream. We'll talk more about it in just a few moments. But it is a dream that in time makes Peter the person who will open the door to, to all of the people 
that throughout his life he has been taught to hate. And he is going to open the gateway for other people, not only Peter, to love them in Christ. He is used to raise Dorcas from the dead. Can you imagine the scene that morning, that day? Peter takes her up, takes her by the hand, and she comes back to life. A great man of God, but he never seems to be new enough to be okay as he is. Isn't that a kick in the stomach? Everything that Peter does is absolutely understandable to me because I'm as human as he was. Unfortunately, Peter was to become a citizen of a new domain. And the standards that Peter had used no longer matched the person he was to become, so God was going to keep. You just want to say booting him upstairs? You understand what I mean by that. The applicable standard for Peter was to become human in the same way that Jesus was human, and that does not mean that he was to become a well-bandaged, broken human. He was to become much more than that. God kept introducing new standards, and God does that with any disciple. Peter was expected to change. And in his case, being only human was no longer okay. That's why God had to keep prompting, prompting him. It was no longer relevant to God's tasks for Peter. I've often felt like Peter. I've often asked, how much change do I have to go through before it's finally enough? And I've really come to the feeling that the answer is more than you want, and by the way, it won't ever end, not on this life. That stretching is beyond my comfort zone. And it's exactly what Jesus Christ is doing with every one of us. To be used, any disciple must submit to God's myriad changes. We tend to resist, but what we ought to do is accept and cooperate. The slide suggests that there are three times when a particular story is given in a two-chapter stretch of the book of Acts. Not exactly the same story, but it's always based on the same story. in the world would God, who knows how to write pretty well, why would God put the same story three times back to back to back? And the answer is that God is persistent and God is choosy about who communicates God's name when the outcome of that communication matters. Peter must change in ways that help other people change. All disciples must change kingdoms. That's what it means to be a disciple, isn't it? And if I were suddenly to pack up stuff and move to New Zealand, I would have to change my lifestyle. It would be silly for me to try to be a U.S. citizen while living in New Zealand as a citizen there. And the same basic idea applies here. Disciples have to change kingdoms and must change the kings, the authority sources that we prioritize. Now I told you I would give you a little insight into that story that changes but is repeated three different times in two chapters. 
The basic part of the story is that Peter, staying at the house of that tanner, goes up on the roof and does probably what anybody would do on a nice day, falls asleep in the sun and all that goes with it. And in the middle of that time, he has this dream in which a sheet is lowered down. It has all kinds of animals that this man now living at a tanner's house for a time recognizes as being unclean animals. And a voice says to Peter, get up and eat. And Peter goes, excuse me, but see, I... I know the scriptures. I know that I'm not supposed to eat these, so I'm not going to. I'm not going to disobey my Lord. That coming down dream happens three different times. And finally, something happens. And I'd like to rather than just reading those three stories all together so you can compare and contrast, I don't know what you get out of that, but let me give you three different things that the Lord is teaching Peter and us through the three times when that story comes up. The first one, in verse 14, surely not, Lord, Peter replied, I've never eaten anything impure or unclean voice spoke to him a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Jumping down to verse 20 in Acts chapter 10. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them. That is, people who have come from a Roman centurion who lives in the very city where the bulk of Roman troops are constantly placed. Representatives of a Roman imperialist pig, do you want to say that? But a Roman soldier, the people we hate, do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Down in verse 22, the men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion, he is a righteous and God-fearing man, apparently there were such people among the Romans, who is respected by all the Jewish people. So God has been very careful who to pick for these first Roman converts. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then... Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. Jews would never consider doing that. And as a guest already, it was quite an imposition. But see, the very first thing that you learn from the first story is you have no idea what you're going through, what's going on, Peter. You just do what I tell you. Just follow the instructions. We'll get to understanding it later. Just do what I tell you. They travel. They get to Caesarea Maritima, the heartbeat of Roman power in, in Judea. And in verse 33, now we are all here, the centurion is saying, now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. So the second climax, second time through the story, is that God accepts every nation. Now I would have you jump down to get a little bit more of this because even though it's in the same basic time period of the story, it's going to set us up for the third climax, down in verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. 
The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then flip the page, or at least I need to, to chapter 11, verse 15. And Peter is reporting now back to the people who were in Jerusalem, who are coordinating the activities of the church there. And he's making this report to people who themselves haven't gone through the experience and they still don't want this gospel, this precious thing about Jesus to be spread to Gentiles. Verse 15, Peter says, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. And then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So obviously that is a sign this is something about Jesus that's happening in these Romans. So if God gave them the same spirit he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? And the third climax, I think, is best summarized by saying, Peter isn't in control of this anymore. The Holy Spirit is setting the agenda. It's really just a fascinating piece to see. Changes of that magnitude in the very strongest of things we love and the strongest of things we hate. Changes are expected, are required of believers who hold to the Word of God. Sometimes obeying God takes us in directions that we will find objectionable. Believers have to allow the Holy Spirit to do that. So God, for that reason, uses prepared disciples, people who have integrity, built upon what Peter is going through, to follow God, even if God changes what God had earlier communicated. Peter would not change unless God personally came into his life and said, I want you to eat these animals on the sheet as God told him to do the change. Disciples' starting points matter. And you see, that's why you have to know all of these different things that before the story in Acts 11, 10, and 11 that Peter has gone through. Because all of those are the starting points that set Peter up to be the Peter of Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11. Peter was thus the very man that God would use to produce change in, in an incredibly sinful, lost world. That's going to be a big thing. They haven't gotten their own Jewish people fully in line at this point. Never do. And yet, Peter is going to be starting the message out to... Well, if your heritage is roughly like mine is, out to people like us in future generations. If this story doesn't happen, we don't get in. As Jesus told Peter to change wave after wave after wave, Peter changed. And he kept changing. I wonder if we misread or misevaluate Peter. God told Peter to change. You and I probably would dig in our heels and say, look, if you don't like me the way I am, goodbye. Peter kept changing. I wonder if we misread or misevaluate him. He had become believable to the people outside of his immediate clique. That's why the message could go beyond where he was. All of this had to happen for the outreach to happen. No story about Peter in Acts chapter 10 and 11 
You have nothing for Paul to do when he makes this mission to the Gentiles much bigger in the future. Paul prepared Peter for some really critical stuff. Being prominent as a mistake maker who adjusted himself under God's leading, and that's really what it is. That qualified Peter to lead others through changes that they needed in following God. I want you to understand, because I need to understand, making mistakes was not Peter's claim to fame. Peter qualified as a link in God's chain by changing. Peter is not the patron saint of I am human and my failure is okay and so is yours. And yet time after time when I hear us talking about Peter, we put him into that line as a way of almost excusing ourselves for being human. Surely by now you know that I am blunderful. Oh, I didn't say wonderful, did I? You know I am blunderful. Staying the same very often keeps me from feeling settled. Isn't that odd? Because, you see, if I stay the same, I'm out of step with the Lord, and then I can't feel settled. My blunders seem justifiable. So, I say, oh, I could keep them. You see, I'm, I'm just human. People buy that. But as I look at how Peter is described in Scripture as representative, I think, of all of us, that will not fly with the Lord. I need to often be repointed to listen better to the Holy Spirit. Through the wonderful insight of hindsight, I realize God's constant preparing hand. I'm not as good at understanding before I get into something what I'm getting into as I am at realizing what I have gone through and what it's taught me. So I keep making the blunders because I don't anticipate the stuff. And I wonder if you might be able to tell the same story with reference to yourself or with the people who most impact you. This is a change and then change and keep doing that. God's continuing prodding for believers to change is very typically a whole lot bigger than I want it to be. I, I'm not in a position to tell God to back off. None of us are. And the truth is that what I'm talking about is a biblical norm. Let me give you a couple of examples. Moses was born as a slave and very soon had his identity distorted by adoption as an Egyptian prince. Now, I don't know how long he was allowed to go back and forth between the palace and his home. But can you imagine the personality conflict as in one setting you are the prince of, is of Egypt, the power, people have to bow to you because the Pharaoh said you have to do that. Ooh, everybody pays attention to you. Then you go back to your birth parents and they are slaves, crud. Hebrews, and you have to balance that. Somehow balance those two parts. When he was at the burning bush, and you, you I'm gonna paraphrase the story, but you'll recognize it. When he was at the burning bush, he almost said, in a way, really did say, 
I finally get settled out here in the wilderness. I've been here for 40 years. I'm finally settled. And you want me to do what, Yahweh? Go back to where I was so confused. I had no idea what I was doing. You want me to what? Lead them away? There are two million of them. I've been gone for 40 years. <coughs> you want me to walk? <coughs> or I think about David, the shepherd who was drafted into the king's service. I get drafted. That means that I got to do what they told me to do, even if I didn't want to do it. David, the shepherd, was drafted into the king's service, and he was re 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 exposed to very high level changes throughout the rest of his life you know the story of david we've gone through some of his material quite intensely together daniel and his friends were sculpted to be god fearing and they faced a lot of tests so at one point daniel was gathered up with a group of astrologers and whatever other wise men for execution and he said wait a minute he arranged some things he would then arrange to be able to tell the king nebuchadnezzar his dream and to save all of them as far as i know i'm not exactly sure who was saved and if anybody was executed but at least daniel and his friends were allowed to live after that the failure of what their wise men abilities had prevented them from doing. And he didn't, he didn't simply have his life risked that one time. You remember, he was thrown into a lion's den later in his life. And it's not as though God simply puts a guy through one thing and it's one and done. And then he gets to see his friends thrown into a fiery furnace so hot that it killed the people who threw them in and you have to say they're gone well, wait a minute who are those three uh, who are the four walking in the furnace I mean God is constantly causing this kind of reworking ourselves and what we consider to be plausible and What's actually happened? The fellow who became the Apostle Paul, Saul in the beginning, originally destroyed Christians passionately. And then he changed oh, a lot more than once in order to counter who he had been. He had to let, even though he was personally recruited by God from a, one lifestyle into another, he had to appear before the 11 disciples and let them tell him what the gospel he was already preaching really was and they had to figure out how they put it, all of those pieces together. And that level of change, given what you see in those and other biblical accounts, is the normal Christian life. And yet, we get really bothered if the Lord tries to change us from one thing to another. And I would like to propose that that bothered doesn't come from the Lord. You have to figure out where it does come from. But since he's constantly doing this, the bothered part doesn't come from him. Review your life. What has God prepared you to know, to become? It's not what, what are you right now. What, what is it that if God had his say in what your life was shaped like, what would it be? How would you communicate that? Let me wonder, are, are you somehow privileged as a disciple who doesn't have an assignment portfolio, a task that God has given to you? I uh, hate to tell you this if you're hoping, but there is no such thing for a believer. 
To be saved is to be entered into the Great Commission at one level or another. What must a believer accept without liking because of who that believer is becoming in the working of Almighty God? Let me wonder with you. I keep talking change, change, change. Can I keep, could I be a little more specific? Oh yeah, and you all like it because I had trouble putting the list together. Over the years, I've noticed what God has asked me to change. I bet this matches a lot of what God asks you to change. Here are some of the things. God has asked me to change what I think, what I choose to say. He has asked me to change who and what I value. He has asked me to change what I find dependable and what I select to gain safety. God has asked me to change what I consider joy and what I consider to be fulfilling, and he has done that consistently in a culture and surrounded by a media that keeps trying to pull me in the opposite direction. God has called me to change how I use resources, who I most respect, and how I gain respect myself, and who I try to impress, and how I manage my sexuality. That's a pretty comprehensive list. Every one of them involves a basic that defines who I am. And, and you got the same list, didn't you? Any or all of those things may be reworked at any time. And, darn it, any one of those basics may be reworked any number of times. Don't set staying unchanged in what most matters to you as a life goal. Because then you and I and the people around us will just feel wrong. Because God won't let us feel different than that. Jesus' death and his resurrection broke every pattern that was known to mankind. Because basically every pattern that is known to mankind means that humans take care of number one. And he violated that. Jesus listened to his father more than to any other or all other sources including the fact that he listened to his father more than he listened to himself. That upsets everything that we know about being human. He lived a life on the basis of, I can accept, I can afford to even to die as long as my father has my back. Can you imagine? People don't know that what he is doing really works. And so believers or non-believers alike look at Jesus and they say, I, I'm starting to understand this. They, we, say, I, I'm recognizing that this self-giving is not just something that was right for Jesus, but he's saying that it's right for me too. I, I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with that. But do I have to tell you how the whole story came out? That when we celebrate these broken and spilled symbols, 
the story came out that God actually stood behind Jesus and therefore produced in what we're doing today a testimony that when we follow in line with what Jesus did, he covers us. We don't have to play the games. It's, it's something we repeat constantly so that we know, oh, it works. It's meant for me. It, it's not just a Jesus thing. It's meant for disciples to trust the God who stood behind his son in Gethsemane and on the cross and all of that stuff. I invite us to dare to let God change us because we know the outcome of the story. That we're not just coming up with something to defend ourselves and preserve ourselves. We're, we naturally tell the wrong story of what doesn't work. And then we accredit it and then we wonder how come life is coming out the way that it does. Listen to the wrong source, I guess, is the best way to say that. You know, the Lord who calls us to these changes is competent to do that. Oh, and, and one other thing that you tell me if I didn't tell you first. Absolute love is behind this. It's not as though we're being pulled in, wouldn't you like to be destroyed for the name of Jesus? It's mo far more than that. It's, wouldn't you like to be eternally redeemed and built in the most beautiful way in the name of Jesus? And by the way, this is the track that the story has to take. Pat, in just a moment, we're going to share a symbol of the broken body of Jesus. Just the beginning of the story, however. And I would invite you to pray that we understand it, that when we get ready to take it into ourselves, that we really do. Would you pray, please? Precious Heavenly Father, we come before you this moment in time, and we do pray that this, this um, symbolic um, message that you have given us to remember will become real and deep in our understanding, that we would know and remember the cause and remember that you died for us. Nobody that ever existed ever died for us in that way. And I pray that that would become a something that just takes over our lives to understand <coughs> the importance of Christ coming and dying for us. And so now we remember that as we share this bread and we remember that every day every day of our lives, and that we seek to serve him in the way that he shows us, the way that he brings us and teaches us in our life, and that we would not stay where we are now, but that we would grow, and we would move forward, and we would progress towards the time when our Lord shall return. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, as Pat has just done, he gave it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body broken for you. Please distribute that out. <laughs>
realize that a piece of cracker can't talk, but boy, can it communicate. In symbol, the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ, we share it together in remembrance of him. So there is a second part of our ritual this morning. A part that allows us to recognize that Jesus didn't hold back anything. When his blood was gone, it was death. I mean, the story in human terms was done. But in God's terms, it wasn't. As we anticipate sharing this symbol of, in God's terms, it wasn't done, would you lead us in prayer? In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, as Musa has just done, he gave it to them, saying, all of you, drink this. This cup is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Would you please distribute the element? I had the worth of the amount of gold that's in this glass, we would think of it as being really valuable, wouldn't we? But, but this really is more. In symbol, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, we share it together in remembrance of him.
When our service is completed this morning, I will ask that you take the two containers and anything else that you'd like to place in the trash can and do that, it will be your responsibility so that nobody else has to touch what you have touched. We will do the normal closing, which is to say we will be standing momentarily and we'll share in one verse of Bless Be the Tie. And when that's done, I'm asking that we be seated again because Pat will then be able to share with us from the information she has concerning the search committee. So let's stand together and sing. Genuine. 